Sorry, guys. I didn't bring a sword. Bruh. It's Sean O'Connell, the managing editor here at Cinemobile, and back for another weekly Snyder Cut conversation as we continue to work our way through each of the members of the Justice League and break down how different they will be from the theatrical cut to Zack Snyder's Justice League. And I have to bring along with me Hannah Solik, who has been soldiering through all of these comparisons. Hi, Hannah. How are you? I'm good. Sean, do you smell that? Do I smell what, Hannah? Not because we're not going to have a terrible, jokey Batman, and I'm very excited to talk about it. Yeah, poor Ben was really cut off at the knees in terms of how he was treated. We can really point at Ben Affleck's Batman and say, not only did you get hurt by this film, but the films that you wanted to make going forward got decimated. Hello, darkness, my old friend. We are clinging to the hope that bringing Zack Snyder's Justice League back to HBO Max restores the Snyderverse and maybe gives Ben a chance to continue uh, in the old man grizzled Batman that we met in, in BVS. So we'll see how that plays out. Fingers crossed. Yes. All right, so let's go ahead and just dive right into what was problematic about Batman slash Bruce Wayne's portrayal in Justice League. So, um, Sean, would you like to start? <laughs> Where do you begin? Um, okay, so this goes back around to something we've been pointing out about each of the characters, which is that when you take the four hours of the complete vision of what uh, Zack was trying to do and you cut it down to two hours, it's going to hurry along uh, everyone's story arc. And for Bruce in this movie, his motivation is building the team. His motivation is in realizing the mistake that he made in BVS by not fully trusting in Superman and then having to live up to the legacy of what Superman left behind and then potentially as the movie goes on, uh, restore Superman to his position of power in the Justice League. So Bruce has a lot emotionally going on. And all of that gets... Um, I was going to say, but you wouldn't know it. <laughs> no, you certainly wouldn't watching the, uh, the version of Theatrical Cut because they sacrifice just about all of that for uh, quips. Steve Trevor tell you that? And Batman is not quippy. That's the opposite of what the saying is. Zack did say to us on the set of Justice League that, that Batman can be funny. Like there's an element or a way to approach his humor, but he's supposed to be the straight man. Uh, mm -hmm. He's supposed to be responding to other people who are funny, like Flash or Aquaman. Um, and 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 being funny in the fact by like you almost laugh because he's so not funny like he's so uber serious which leads to the joke in the lego movie about like you know everything being so dark and somber and yes and i think you still have to maintain that that element of the character i think it's really bad if you go too far in the other direction yes because they did say that like it was always intentional even when zach was working on the project that they wanted justice league to have a lighter tone sure than bbs so batman was always going to be maybe a little bit lighter but that doesn't mean he was not going to be dark <laughs> no 100 percent. and he knows who he is in that universe as well too so the the line that i'm pretty sure is still going to be held is when flash says what are your superpowers again I'm rich. That's a Batman joke. Um, it's that kind of like dry, witty, like not necessarily sarcasm, but it's just like, it's very, it's, it's subtle. Unlike <laughs> all and, of his jokes in Justice League. Well, and the problem with the jokes in Justice League too, uh, in the theatrical cut, we'll call it Justice League, I'm sorry, is that you can tell so desperately that they were recorded elsewhere and punched in. <laughs> um, the cutaway at the end of the Monument Park fight where he's laying on what looks to be artificial astroturf. It doesn't look anything like the grass that's part of the scene that they were on. And he's just like, oh, yeah, oh, something is definitely bleeding. Horrendous. Um, the, the really, uh, first off, the, the, I think my least favorite line in the entire thing was when Superman at the end of the movie says like, uh, well, I knew you didn't bring me back because you like me. And then oh. Bruce is like, <laughs> I don't. Not. What, what is not even? <laughs> I don't even understand that answer. And and then of course the the scene that is the most cringy. This this is without a doubt the most cringy scene in theatrical cut, which is when Superman returns. They pan mm. to all the faces of the Justice League members, and Batman like smiles, like he's glue, <laughs> like he's just yeah. happy. It's like what? No, it's so it's the worst betrayal of character. Oh my god, I've I forgot ever seen. about that. Oh, it's awful. Yeah. It's so awful. I feel like half of Batman's responsibility in the final act was just like 
gasping or like reacting. Right. There's so many badass moments from Zach's uh, early trailers. My turn. Come together. And instead, in theatrical cut, he tumbles into it and he's climbing up the wall. And then they make him punch in and, and give another line reading where he's like, "Sorry, guys." I didn't bring a sword. No, but it's cool. Or he when looks he's at like, Steppenwolf and he's like, Jesus, he is tall. Oh, God, that's so <laughs> bad. All of those things are bad. Um, yeah. And so, and you know that they were just things that, that Joss essentially was brought in to do, which is bring humor or levity. And, and these are things that he was able to do in Avengers, but I don't think that those additions or the humor in the Avengers betrayed those characters. Tony was relatively funny. Even Thor was was funny in the in the realm of Asgard. So when you gave them jokes, it wasn't out of place. Yeah, and to that point, like they let Captain America kind of be like that straight, you know, he doesn't understand anything that's going on and that's right. funny in and of itself. I understood that reference. So it's yes. like what you were talking about earlier, like I don't understand why he didn't just leave Batman alone. Right, no, I know. Um, but I think that the, Batman has to carry the bulk of the film. The film mm -hmm. is really told through his point of view as he's going on this this arc uh, in order to recruit the League. They kind of give him that assignment at the end of BVS where he's like, we're going to need more people. There's a bigger threat coming. He meets Lex Luthor and Luthor tells him, The bell's already been rung. And so Batman knows he needs to be prepared. And that is that is a defining characteristic of Batman is that he is overprepared for any mm -hmm. type of threat that may come. And so you can understand why that would drive him to, to have to uh, put this team together. But I want to see the full-blown interactions between uh, him trying to recruit Ezra Miller's Barry Allen. I want to see him go and, and go toe to toe with Aquaman and not in the, you know, hacked up version that, that we see in theatrical cut. Oh, that shit. I want to see a little less of his really intense flirtationship with Diana Prince. I'll just say that. I think Joss leaned way too heavily into that in theatrical cut. And yeah. a second note, anything that Bruce Wayne does in that movie is not how Bruce Wayne would flirt. <laughs> Like, that Very just doesn't true. make sense. No, watch the scene where they flirt with each other in BVS when they're at that cocktail party and they're talking about the sword and who it belongs to. Like, that's smoldering. And that's, yeah. you're right, that's what Bruce Wayne would do. Yeah, not, it's would not. Steve Trevor tell you to do that? Oh my God. <laughs> I can't even think of what else he does, but I know it's cringy. Oh, it's gross. There's a scene where he's like taking off his costume uh, later on in the thing because he's been injured. And um, it's, <laughs> it's late in the film. I think it's after the Monument Park fight where they're- Yeah. Uh, it, it gets a little too uncomfortable. Like that's not the relationship between Batman and Wonder Woman at no. all. Uh, it's no. just somebody who doesn't understand the dynamic of the team. I'm only interested in her skill set. I'm sure you are. Can we? Okay, so another way that we know that Batman will be changed in Zack Snyder's Justice League is that his arc is going to be restored. Probably more even uh, fully restored than we anticipated based on what was going to be coming in the yeah. um, Justice League that was coming in 2017 because of this additional photography. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really great, interesting backstory that Zack has hinted at in his films, and I I think he's going to try to work some of that mm. in to what we see now in the HBO Max version, specifically with this additional photography, including Jared Leto's Joker. And so this has led to some rampant speculation about how much we might see in terms of in BVS, we know that Batman lost a Robin. We see a Robin suit. It's got Joker scrawl on it. There was a theory that was running around recently that said that Joker may have, uh, I, I think we know that he beats that Robin to death mm -hmm. based on comic accuracy. And there was a hint that he could have possibly burned him um, and, and maybe created a fire, which is why the Wayne Manor looks like it has been burned now from the inside, that this might be part of that confrontation. I can't confirm that, but this is what some people have been discussing. And they do have to somewhat address why Bruce has moved to the lake house and doesn't use Wayne Manor. Now it's possible that he just sort of let it fade from his years uh, fighting crime in Gotham. But that would be a pretty significant turn of character, you know, to, to move him and Alfred out to that otherwise gorgeous lake house <laughs> and, and let his family go to rot unless something really truly horrible had happened in that in that house and the mm -hmm. death of a Robin could absolutely be that. So the fact that Zack is bringing back Joker means that we could get a lot more backstory for Batman, which I think is gonna fill in. That's the benefit of starting with a much older Batman is that he has years and years of uh, experience that you can lean on. And instead in theatrical cut, you get a horrible like. Well, this is the days when one's biggest concerns were exploding wind up penguins. 
a simple life. Right. Yeah. Just barely bad stuff. And so to that end too, I think you're going to get a lot more with Alfred and those um, conversations. I, I love Jeremy Irons as Alfred. I really do. And I think he was a great contribution to Ben in BVS. And I think that their dynamic is going to be further explored in Zack Snyder's Justice League because you could tell that all of the conversations between uh, Bruce and Alfred in Theatrical Cut and Justice League were, were definite reshoots. And I know that Zack knows a better way to treat Alfred. So I think his arc will continue that way too. Yeah, and in a lot of the early trailers, there's a lot of like lines from Bruce Wayne about, you know, like- I think it's something more, something darker. You know, when, when he's staring at like the holographic Superman or whatever, and it's like, you'd think he'd kind of lean on Alfred a little bit more to kind of have some of those deeper, darker discussions about what he's kind of feeling and going through, and we didn't get to see. No. any of that <laughs> and and it's true like all of his conversations with alfred and bvs are the ones that drove him forward to not yes. trust superman we have to destroy him but he is not our enemy not today 20 years in gotham alfred we've seen what promises are worth to that end i think bruce is going to be the most fascinating character and we've touched on this leading up to the other characters um when they have the discussion about whether or not it's a good idea to bring superman back um, and I think Bruce's motivations and Bruce's explanations as to why he needs to do that can be really compelling uh, in the Not hands just of ben Diana Affleck. going, why? Because of your guilt? Exactly. And so that's material that I can't wait to see Ben Affleck explore. Also, like you talked about, the final confrontation it's an opportunity to see Batman in his in his element, you know, like mm -hmm. he's going to be using all of his tools and you're going to be able to see him taking down parademons and contributing to the final confrontation against Steppenwolf. But there's still the aspect of he's a man, you know, in a situation where it's huge demons and gods from, you know, underneath the sea and, and Wonder Woman herself. He's still kind of he's not outmatched, um, but he still has to be wrestling with this. There's he's a got lot his limitations. Going on here. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and he's got to be wrestling with this. There's a lot going on here that I've never seen before. Uh, you know, the introduction of an alien character in BVS in, in Superman rocked Batman's world. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting to a point where he's seeing this whole array of new people. And I kind of want to see how Zack treats that material because I think you can take it seriously and, and have it really resonate. And um, not have parademon smell fear. <laughs> And that's Batman's contribution. <laughs> what do you want from me? Fear. That whole sequence is so painful. The the lines that that actor, the guy from Mindhunter, has to give, where he's like, "Because they know he's dead, right?" Superman. <laughs> like, hello, criminal. I didn't realize you were contributing to the narrative. Like, here. oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, even you figured this uh, out, criminal. He's that's paying really more attention than Aquaman. Great. <laughs> Yes, true. So uh, there's so many scenes that I just know, like the first confrontation between uh, Batman and Arthur Curry is going to be amazing. Like that's going to be so epic and and not played for laughs. Like, you know how badly it is when they pan over to the wall and you see the sketch artwork of, of the the uh, mother boxes in oh, Arthur yeah. <laughs> in the tavern? Like, it's yeah. just awkward. Like, that's not how it's going to get handled. So Yeah, no, uh, you, that was, yeah, mm -hmm. bad. Um, so let's talk about, <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So I've read that we think, not we, but people think that um, a nightmare scene is potentially going to open yes. uh, Zack Snyder's cut. And some people are saying that because Batman's opening scene obviously was a reshoot with the Mindhunter guy, I'm so sorry, I do not know his name. And we know that basically that scene was there to set up Batman knowing that parademons don't like noise and they can smell fear, which is why he uses sound waves in the third act and all that. Right, so right. a lot of people are speculating that something could happen in the nightmare scene that would then impact how he could help in the third act. And I didn't okay. know if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I've heard a couple different theories. Um, I don't think it's going to open with a nightmare because I think it's going to open with the death of Superman, shown from the perspectives of Batman and Lois Lane. There could be a nightmare sequence shortly after that, but there's two things I've heard about the nightmare sequences. One is that Cyborg is going to have some sort of mm -hmm. um, look into a nightmare sequence, and it will come when he's interacting with the mother boxes because the mother boxes essentially helped create him. Now, I don't know if that is going to be in the middle of the film at one point when uh victor stone interacts with the mother box or if it's going to occur later in, like in the third act during the final battle where he's maybe potentially trying to pull the mother boxes apart and he gets a view into the nightmare sequence at that point um 
the other rumor that's going around in terms of the nightmare sequence is that if it continues on in the one that we got to see in bvs that there's an element that might have joker and deathstroke fighting alongside batman in the nightmare mm. sequence because it will essentially have gotten to the point where earth is so overrun and and it's uh dark side is so powerful and it's such a disaster for everybody on the planet that anyone who's alive is just banding together to fight. And they have a conversation about like, well, how come Joker isn't affected by the anti-life equation, which is the thing that turns Superman dark. Mm -hmm. And Batman has a line that says something like he's just such a, a lunatic that it doesn't hmm. affect him because his brain is, is, is broken. I don't know if that is um, fan speculation or if that's legitimately somebody... Somebody knows something that's happening, but it goes a long way to the fact that Batman had that Joker card on him in the first mm -hmm. BBS, and that as part of the trailer we saw at DC Fandom, uh, a very obvious Joker card yes. floats up to the front. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's uh, main takeaway. We know that the nightmare sequence will be a major plot point. <laughs> which, 100%. And it didn't yes. even exist. In the and it would be cool if there um, are two of them. It'd be cool if there is mm. one early on and it involves Batman and then later Cyborg sees another one. Because again, we're talking about a story where Zack was laying the groundwork for Darkseid coming to Earth. And on this most recent stream um, that the League of Mayhem had where Zack was a guest, for two hours he's talking about the fact that he has the plot in his mind of where the justice league sequel will go and it involves dark side coming to earth now he didn't confirm whether he's gonna be able to actually do this but he knows where the story is supposed to go and this four hour cut is supposed to lay out the groundwork for that to happen um i, I think the nightmare sequence is fascinating because it shows um the, it, a it shows the direction of where the story is going to go it's hard to pick up from where you left off because Superman just crushed Bruce Wayne's chest, essentially. And I would assume killed him because um, I don't know how you come back from that necessarily. So the nightmare sequence would have to take you into another component of it. And I don't really know how they're going to do that. And the only yeah. one way to do it is to go in through another character and sort of show us where Cyborg That's is interesting. at that point. So we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. It's very interesting. One other quick thing before we talk about where uh, Ben Affleck's Batman could possibly go from here. Mm. Um, so at the end of BBS, uh, Lex's, the Bell's, you know, warning, we saw that. Mm. And I think it was the first look uh, with Wonder Woman in the cave that Zack Snyder released. Mm. So we also know that that's actually going to be relevant in Zack's cut instead of in Justice League where they just completely ignored Lex Luthor until the end. Correct. Well, because Zack was laying out the groundwork of a much larger universe, you know, to sort of right. say, like, these are where all of these villains are. This is where certain characters are going to be. And I actually heard that there were scenes um and again i don't know how much of this is speculation but that there were going to be arkham scenes mm -hmm. that either moved lex to um arkham asylum where you would get a look at jared leto's joker or other characters because for a while ben's script i thought um i'd heard it described a little bit like and i don't know which version of this script that ben was working on and i don't know if this is the final one that he was going to do but you know that movie the raid um it's like it's like a die hard movie where one guy <laughs> there's one cop who has to get into the bottom floor of a building and uh -huh. work his way all the way to the top where the boss is going to be and so on each floor he goes through different levels of you know horrific bad guys that they would do that but in arkham asylum which mm. is the, the main prison with every batman villain mm -hmm. and so batman would have to get from you know ground level to the top level but go through all of his famous villains to get to that mm. point and i don't know if they're still building toward that or if that's something that they're going to tease out so you'd see some of those elements brought in where like lex could be pulled into play and it could tease it but that all of this was when ben was going to take his his movie and go in a different direction the other yeah, thing too I, is that, I, or sorry go ahead oh i thought ben also was going to potentially be doing a movie that would involve deathstroke um, with Joe Manganella, Man Manga Man Manganello, Manganello. <laughs> Manganello uh, playing Deathstroke, but that movie could potentially also involve Jared Leto. So there were a lot of possibilities mm -hmm. about where Ben was going to go. He just never really opened up about which version of the script he had landed on. I know. That's how this works. I also read something about Lex that said that Batman was supposed to go visit him in prison, and that's how he learned about the mother boxes, not through the painting on <laughs> no you, you forget also that that's how batman found out about the mother boxes too is that he uh netted that alien against the wall and when the alien shook and blew oh. up it yeah. left mother boxes behind and then poor alfred had to come in and be like matches the other sightings and that pattern is all over luther's notes oh god 
Ah, oh my god. Terrible. So they, like these are all horrific things that were explained poorly in theatrical cut that we're going to get legitimate explanations mm -hmm. for with true character motivation when uh, Snyder Cut plays on HBO Max. All right, so our last section is that potentially in Zack Snyder's Justice League, Ben Affleck's Batman could be set up for a continued story. Yeah, and this comes down to just the fascinating elements of, are we gonna treat this as a time capsule uh, feature that's like, hey, this is what I was doing in 2017, I'm getting a chance to finish it, but this is all that it is. In which case you could have um, the hint at the suggestion of the formation of the Justice League and the Hall of Justice being at the at Wayne Manor, but it doesn't pay off in any sort of direction. Or we get to the point where Zack is able to set up the continuation of some of this stuff happening on HBO Max and an announcement that Ben is going to continue with a movie or a short mini series or something that continues. And I think there's a rumor that it's Ooh, a series. I like rumors. <laughs> <laughs> we are not confirming anything. Okay. But there is a rumor that there is um, a TV, a limited TV series that uh, Ben Affleck is currently in negotiations. The only for. reason why I think that that is unusual is that they've also announced that Gotham City detective series that is going to be tied to Matt Reeves' universe. Now, yeah. listen, can you have both? Absolutely. Like, I think fans will be able to, to manage that without being too confused. Your dreams, Alfred. I would love to see Ben continue. And I would love to see some type of tease about a direction where they are going to go with a limited series i think hbo max is the perfect place to do that i think that's a great opportunity for that streaming platform to capitalize on the access that they have to these very popular dc characters to to dial fully into the passion that clearly um zach's fan base has for a continuation of the snyder verse and you allow other filmmakers to play with the characters in other versions uh whether it's matt reeves's version or even letting ben do some stuff in the flash but then give him an opportunity from like i said from everything that he's been saying in interviews over the years he has a script that he likes a lot and, Maybe um, they'll make his movie on HBO Max. It'll be straight to streaming. Like, why not? I don't understand why they wouldn't do that. So um, I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful that all that sort of gets teased out uh, for the next, for the, for the final minutes of the four-hour Snyder Cut when it comes to HBO Max, and then we have a better sense of. But, but that's a huge mystery right now. It's a huge mystery of whether this is going to be a one and done or if this is setting the stage for, for more in this world. We'll see. We'll see. I, I think conversations have been had behind the scenes. Like, I think we're we're having a lot of fun speculating on all of this. Um, but I'm fairly certain that the people in positions of power have an idea where they want to go with this. So we'll see. We'll see. Obviously, we're going to be covering everything about Zack Snyder's Justice League as we get closer to the release on HBO Max. So make sure you keep it here on Cinema Blend. While you're here, go down and hit subscribe and turn on your notifications because every time we post a video, we want you to come on over here and watch it.